preparing for growth. But before we get there, I have a couple jokes for you in, in honor of uh, our festive weekend about America, our patriotic weekend. So I thought I would give some patriotic jokes to you before we get going. So the first one is, what did, the, what did one flag say to another flag? Nothing, they just waved. <laughs> now, most, some of you will get this, some of you won't, but you have to know who's who. What do you get when you cross Captain America with the Incredible Hulk? The Star Spangled Banner. Oh, if you don't know, the Incredible Hulk's real name is Bruce Banner. So. What do you call tea that tastes like freedom? Liberty. Hey. Hey. And last but not least, I found some gas today for $1.39. Would you like to know where I found it? Taco Bell. Hey. All right. Yeah. Some of you will get that later. <laughs> yes. Hopefully not. That's good. I like that. Good comeback. <laughs> well, it's good to laugh in church, right? I mean, you can't be too serious. Serious, what do they say? Serious is not a fruit of the Spirit. Yep. Well, promotion and power, promotion and power we're talking about today. Last week, we touched on promotion and power a little bit last week. I was talking about David, you know, and how David was promoted, and we, and sometimes promotion is not all that it's cracked up to be. Because when David was promoted, obviously, he didn't, it did not go too well for him after he entered into his um, new job. You know, we talked about when he was actually, after he got hired by the king, after he killed Goliath, that the next day he went to work to do, as a musician again, to play for the king, and, and a spear was thrown at his head twice. So, you know, we looked at that and how our working environment can be a little bit hostile. But, you know, David went from, he went from watchman and shepherd boy to what? He went, the next thing he had was the music gig for the king. And then from there, he was a delivery man for a day, delivering some provisions to his brothers. And then he killed a giant while he was there. And then the next thing after that, he got promoted to uh, basically general in the army. And then from there, he went on to be a king. But before we get to there, uh, I want to talk about Joseph today. So our main focus is on Joseph. And we left off with that last week. And I want to kind of pick up the story of Joseph because both of their stories are similar a little bit. You know, they both were, they both were looking after the sheep in the field. They were shepherds. And uh, they also both delivered provisions to their brothers. But David, um, you know, David ended up killing a giant. Joseph ended up getting thrown into a well and sold into slavery. So, you know, your past, paths are a little different. Do you know that sometimes your path can change? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Proverbs 18, 16 says this, a man's gift opens doors and makes room for him and brings him before great men. So number one, Proverbs 18, 16, a man's gifts or gift opens doors, makes room for him and brings him before great men. Aren't you glad that your gift, your gift will bring you before great men, people? It'll, listen, let me break it down to you really simple, that the gifts that God has given you should open doors for you and to, to be more successful, and your job, and your life. You know, we think about ministry so much in church, but, you know, practically speaking, when we're in the working world, the gifts that we've been given, the things that God has blessed us with, those, those strengths that we have, those are the things that we should be using in our job. And if we do that and we do them well, promotion comes. That's how promotion comes. We, when, we're, when we're doing, the Bible says, do everything you do unto the Lord. So when I'm working and I'm working for somebody, if I'm employed by somebody, I want to do my job the best that I can because I'm doing it for God. Even if I have a boss like Saul that throws a spear at my head. See, we all have gifts differing. 1 Corinthians uh, 12 and Romans 12 say that we have gifts. Everybody has different, differing gifts, but they, they all work together for a purpose. You know, the word gift in uh, Proverbs 18, it's an actually literally a gift that you would bring to somebody. You know, we think of spiritual gifts, but the gift that you brought, and let me explain it to you like this. So the gift that the wise men brought, they brought, they brought gifts to Jesus, and it brought them before who? The, 
the king of glory, even though he was a toddler. So when you bring a gift, it's the, this word matin in Hebrew is the same word that is used in the Jewish wedding. See, but in the same sim- symbolically as, as the Jesus sent back the Holy Spirit with gifts, he gave us gifts, gave gifts to us. Why? To open doors for us. And it's really about serving. So our gifts, our gifts are given to us to serve. Listen, your gift, your gift is to your gift is for serving other people. The gift on my life is not for me. The gift that has been given to me is not for me, it's for the body of Christ. See, as a prophet, as a prophet, the gift, I, I'm, the prophet is the gift to the church. And the prophetic gift that we see in 1 Corinthians 12, that's the gift, the gift of speaking. But see, when you get into the office gifts, the gift of the apostle, the prophet, they, are, they themselves are the gift to the church. Do you see? So if you stand, listen, you know, so much I see is humility has been such a lost trait in the church. And something that I watched over the years is how people disrespect leadership. I watch how people walk into church demanding and think they can do whatever they want. And, and that I have a gift. I, you know, this, what this scripture doesn't mean is I have a gift on my life, so you have to make room for me. That's not what it means. That's not what it means at all. Talk about humility. You have, your gift is to come and serve. And as you serve, God will elevate you. If you can humble yourself underneath the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he will exalt you. When you, we talked about alignment a couple weeks ago and spiritual authority. We talked about authority, about how alignment is important. So you have to align yourself properly in order for your gifts to be seen and used. Remember, your gifts are for others, to serve others, to bless them. So as we grow in our gifts, our job, our ministries, in God, in most cases, there's promotion, Right? I mean, that's the, that's the goal if we're working. If we want some type of promotion. We want to move ahead in life. Recognition, we want to increase in ability and power and, and responsibility. See, that, that, uh, when, we, when, we, when we desire those things, when we dire, desire more growth, there's a responsibility that comes along with that. There's responsibility. See, power, you just can't, you just can't strive after power and not expect it to be on any responsibility. Power, you know, there's a, there's a quote, with great power comes great responsibility. So what drives people for promotion? What drives them for more power? You know, people in the world, they seek after those things. They seek after building riches. They seek to build wealth. You know, when I scroll down social media, I see these posts, motivational posts. And I think, you know, I love motivational posts, but a majority of all the motivation is like to have a new, better car, have this car, more expensive car, have this beautiful mansion house, have this, you know, smoking hot wife. And, you know, that's the whole idea is to build this wealth and this worldly uh, mandate is to increase, increase, increase. Now, what about in the church, though? Well, in the church, we, we need to prosper, you know, we need, to, we need to grow. We need to prosper. We need to have wealth. Why? Because we need to build the kingdom, and you can't do it without money. It is the currency of this world, but faith is the currency of heaven. So do we want to prosper? Absolutely. Do we want to be promoted? Absolutely. But how and what we're seeking, all that, that's the, that is the definition of, like, why are we seeking? What are we seeking power for? What are, we, what are we running after? Are we running after him and trying to build his kingdom or, in many cases, are we trying to build our own kingdom because there's a lot of wealth to be gathered in the church? There's a lot of wealth to, to be gained. You can listen. <laughs> I remember Jesse Duplantis. I think it was Jesse Duplantis or Larry Savella, one of those guys. And they were talking about how this guy was in prison, and he got, and he, and he, got, he started listening to messages. And, and long story short, he got out of prison, and he started preaching. He started preaching Jerry Savelle's messages, I think it was, and he started his own church, wasn't even called to be a minister, started preaching, doing everything that, the, that he would just preach his, his messages every week that he got them. And so he built this huge church and was collecting all the money and keeping all the money. He became a millionaire until finally he got tracked down by the IRS and they, you know, shut him down. But the, why? Because the gospel works. Listen, you can take those things and you can take the things of God and use them for evil. You can build your own mansion, your own kingdom. Right? We see it sometimes. I'm just saying, you know, listen, 
I, I remember I remember a few months ago, I was prophesying up here on the platform and I saw it. I saw how, how there's ministers out there and they're putting money in their own pockets. You know, I didn't plan on preaching this today, but I just feel like it needs to be said is that they're putting money in their own pockets and God's like, I've had enough of that. In fact, you guys all know Roseanne, right? Rosie, by the way, she's doing amazing. She had, she had bypass, triple bypass last week on, on Thursday, right? Thursday. This week on th um, Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday. Tuesday. On Tuesday, she's doing amazing. She's four days in. She's already back. She's already in rehab. She's doing amazing. But but listen to this. I'm going to let her share this story when she when she gets well enough. But what I went to see her, I came to see her the day that she got out. I came in that night. And when she was stable, we went in. And so I thought it was the anesthesia still still wet work, but it wasn't. She was she was prophesying. She had an experience while she was under. And but one of the things that she talked about, she she talked about the money. She's like the pastor. She's like the leaders and pastors that they're gonna they're they're gonna Jesus is going after them. And she kept saying it over and over. And there was this. She had this experience, and I'm not gonna share all of it, but. It was about that. It was about how God was starting to rattle and shake his church. And he was, and there was going to be some, you know, um, you were going to have to answer for some of the things that were being done. See, we don't want to be in that position, do we? We don't want to be in that position. We want to build his kingdom. Listen, I'm all about building his kingdom and his church. That's what we're after. So let's talk about favor and favoritism. You know, Paul said, Paul said that he was the, out of all the apostles, he considered himself the least. Why? Because of all the things that he did to the church. He persecuted the church, and he considered himself the least of all the apostles. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, it says this, but whatever I am now, whatever I am, it's all because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without results. See, there was results. Paul got results. Even though he wasn't the, even though he wasn't, didn't consider himself the greatest apostle, he said, I, I had results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God working through me by his grace. See, Paul, Paul doesn't claim to be the greatest apostle. We look at him as he is. But one thing he did claim, he's like, but I did more work than any of them. But it wasn't me that did it. It was God doing it through me by his grace. See, it was by the grace of God, the favor. See, favor and grace are both the same. It's the same word. So when favor and grace is on your life, it is to empower you to do great things for God. It should also empower you to do greater things in our work and in our lives, in our home life, whatever we're doing for God. There's a favor that comes on us. There's, say, I have favor. Say it like you mean it. All right, that's better. Ephesians 4, 7 says, Now to each one of us grace has been given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Say it again. Now to each one of us, each one of you, me, you as well, grace, everybody say grace, grace. has been given to me. According to the measure, say it, of the gift of Christ. So what does that mean? It means that that word, that, that word there for measure is metron and it means size it means a me it's a way to measure things so let me say it like this is that the size of the gift on your life that you have determines the amount of grace that goes with it so someone that walks in a greater let's say an international ministry that is called to the nations that travels there's a lot there's a lot of grace on their life to be able to do what they do opposed to somebody like maybe having a local church like we do but it doesn't, does it diminish the grace that's on our life? No, it just means that there's a greater grace or favor on them to be able to do what they, they have been called to do. Do you understand? Amen. But all of us say, I have grace. I have, grace. I have, faith. I have faith. God has gifted me. Gifted all right. Now, Joseph, Joseph, talking about Joseph, if he found grace in the eyes of Pharaoh, in Genesis 30 and 39, 4. See, Joseph found grace and favor in the eyes of Pharaoh. It says, he, and that he prospered in everything that he did. Think about that. Joseph had favor on him, and he prospered in everything that he did because the Lord was with him, the scripture says. Genesis 39, 5. From the time that he put Joseph, that's Pharaoh, put Joseph in charge of his household, and all he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's household on account of him. The, Lord blessed, the Lord's blessing was on everything he owned, both in the, his house and in his field. So Potiphar left the, all that he owned in Joseph's care. 
He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Wouldn't you love to know that being, see, sometimes we look at being second in charge. Sometimes second in charge means you have all authority. Let me say it to you like this. If you were doing a great job and your boss gave you the keys and decided not to come to work for the next month, would he, when he came back, would, he, would, the job, would the business still be running properly? See, that's the type of favor that can be on your life. He didn't concern himself with everything because he saw the favor on Joseph and everything he did was blessed. And he knew this guy's got this gifting on him. He's, he's qualified. He's more than qualified to run my business. And I don't have to worry about anything. I can go, I can go, I can go golf. I can go to the country club. I can hit some balls. I don't have to worry about it. I can go have, I can go to Guanabanas and get some snacks. See, but it didn't start out like that. Oh, see, when we look at Joseph's life, we think, man, this, this kid was, uh, he was pristine. He was amazing. He was, he was righteous. He was, he, man, he was, just, he did it all perfectly. Well, that's not really the case. See, in Genesis 37, 2, it says, Joseph was tending the flock with his brothers. He was out there with his brothers. The sons of his father's wives, Bil Bilhah and, and Zilpah, and he brought their father a bad report about them. He brought their father a bad report. In other words, he snitched on him. He told on him, tattled. See, there's some family drama going on. There's some sibling rivalry happening you know, when we read the Bible, we think that everything was just perfect. Well, I can tell you between the 12 of them, there was some stuff going on. There was some, some hostility happening. You know, I'm going back and telling dad, you did that. I'm telling dad, you're in trouble. I'm going, I'm running, you know, you little, little snuck, come over here, come back here. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, I mean, if we, I mean, I know me and my brother, when we were growing up, I, can, I can't speak for anybody else's family, but I know me and my brother had some words. We had some contention. You know, we, we fought. I mean, most of the times we got along, but there were times when I ran after him and wanted to, like, you know, shh. I can't say that I chased him with a knife. It was a foreshadowing of my career, holding the sword of the Lord, the Bible, not an actual sword. In verse 3, it says, Jacob made him a robe of many colors. See, that robe, that robe was actually a prince's garment. It's something that a prince would wear. So he had this really expensive garment on him, this, this robe, this tunic. And when Joseph's brother saw it, their father loved him more than any of them. They hated him. Even they could not speak a kind word to him. They hated Joseph. Why? Because he was favored. He was, he was Jacob's favorite. See, there's a difference between favor and favoritism. Because favoritism can promote pride. In verse 5, then the dreams happen. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Why? Because he rubbed it in their face. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain in the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered together and bowed down to me. i kind of thinking that's probably the way it went, or the way he said it. See, Joseph did not have full revelation what that dream meant. All he knew was, oh, I had a dream that I'm better than them, and I'm going to go let them know about it. So they respond, do you intend to reign over us, his brothers asked? Will you actually rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and his statements. See, not only did he tell them the dream, but he made some statements, it says there. We don't know what they were, but I'm sure they didn't, it didn't fare too well with him. As his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept in mind all that he said. Now remember that he also had a second dream about the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowing down to him as well. And then his father chimed in and was like, do you think we're going to bow down to you? See, Joseph, Joseph had a dream. In his dream, Joseph's dream was about promotion, provision, and power. Promotion, power, provision. That's what the dream was about. It was also about destiny and calling. But he only had part of it. He only had part of it. See, that happens to us. We have, see, he didn't have the beginning and the middle. He had the end. He had the ending, of the, the ending of everything that was going to happen. See, the dream was prophetic because we know that what Joseph did he, to save Israel and to save his family, that he gathered grain. 
See, that even in the dream that he had, he was always being told ahead of time what exactly was going to happen. He was going to be gathering grain, sheaves of grain together. But he didn't have full understanding. And that happens to us sometimes when we have prophetic dreams. That's why the word says we, we prophesy in part because we know in part. See, he only knew in part. He only knew a portion of what it was, but he didn't have full revelation or understanding. See, the sheaves, the sheaves in verse 7 were, we were binding sheaves of grain in the field and suddenly, so everybody say suddenly. Let me tell you what God means by suddenly, 22 years. From the time he had the dream to the time that came to pass was 22 years. My sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to mine. See, when they came to see Joseph because they were hungry, that's when that dream came to pass 22 years later. See, the dream was signifying that Joseph would be in a position of power and his brothers would help him get there. See, his brothers helped him get there a little faster they were, they, were a little, they were a little perturbed by Joseph, so they decided, well, first we know that he wanted, they wanted to kill him, but then they decided, you know, let's make some money off of him. Let's sell him. <laughs> little, little provision, right? Joseph's a provider. Joseph's name actually means he, his, he will increase. And they did. They increased the money. Another one is because, because of the animosity between them, the arrogance. See, Joseph was arrogant. He was an arrogant young, young kid. And, it, and he rubbed, them, rubbed it in their face. See, Joseph needed to mature. He needed to mature in the gifts that he had. He needed to mature first before God was going to put him in this position of power. See, his brothers were hateful and jealous. And when you're, when you're offended, we talked about offense last week. When you're offended, it will keep you from seeing the truth. It will blind you. You will see through the eyes of hate and jealousy opposed to love and forgiveness. Why? Because he was favored. See, he was favored and he was also favoritism. One is God, one is man. See, favor of the Lord versus he's Jacob's favorite. See, favor of the Lord. Now, it does spur jealousy sometimes, but when you're favored by God, blessing comes when you're favored highly by God, understand that you have to operate in a certain characteristic of God. And that's what, J that's what Joseph had to learn. See, before you receive power, everybody say this, before you receive power, receive power. To, run palace, to run the palace, you will spend time in the pit. <laughs> See, pit, pit, that word pit is prophets in training or people in training or people in transformation. See, Psalm 105, 19, talking about Joseph, says, Until the time that the word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested Joseph. It tested him. The word of the Lord tested him. The dream tested him. See, until it came to pass, we get prophetic words over our life. That word will test you. It will test your character. It with fire, it will try you to make you who you need to be for that word to come to pass. See, that, Lord te that word tested him first 13 years and then 22 years. See, it doesn't matter where you are. If you yield to God, if you yield to God, his favor will prosper you, but you have to yield to him. Joseph had to yield to God. See, he was transformed in prison. The pit transformed him. A lot of people want power, but they want to avoid the pit. <laughs> A lot of people want power, but they want to avoid the transition. They want to, they want to they see, like I was talking about gifting, people come in and, and they, want to, they want to be in a position of power and be on the platform. They want to speak and they want to ministry, but they haven't gone through the process of developing their character. Because the, the gift on your life is what equips you, but the fruit or the, the fruit or the character in your life is what sustains you. That, that is the leadership quality in your life because the gifting can only take you so far because when things get sideways and things get hard, it is the character developed inside of you that is the grit inside of you that bear down and stay and not run when, that, when, the, when, the tra when, that, when everything's coming against you. That's what the character is for. It's to be able to stand in the place that God puts you. See, but Joseph found humility and patience in his imprisonment. 
Proverbs 18, 12 says this, before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. See, he was humbled. He was humbled. When he was in prison, he interpreted two dreams. One, one guy lived, one guy died. In fact, when Joseph was brought out of the pit, it was the cupbearer that was before, before Pharaoh, and they were trying to figure out what all these dreams meant and all, the, all, the, uh, all of his soothsayers and those that practiced incantation and witchcraft, they couldn't figure out what the dreams meant, but the cupbearer is like, I got a guy. Hey, I got a guy back in the prison. And he's like, and I know he knows what to do. He knows how to do this. And so what does he do? Joseph comes out, a good Italian boy. And he's like, I'll interpret your dream. Well, the Lord is going to interpret your dream, not me. And so because of the wisdom on his life, see, it was so precise. That's, that's what God will do. He will take your gift and make it so precise to put you in a position not only to save Egypt, but his own family. See, but the character that he had, he was humble. He came before him. What did he say? The humility on Joseph's life wasn't like, I'm your guy, man. I can do all of this. He was like, well, not only do you need to gather grain for seven years so that you can survive the rest of the famine, but you need to find somebody and put him in charge, and this is the way you need to do it. And he's like, you know, Pharaoh, you need to find somebody to do that for you. And Pharaoh's like, well, I think you're the guy. See, humble, being humble. Matthew 23, 12 says, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those that humble themselves will be exalted. Humble means to make low. To, it means tr to show humility, true lowliness, by being fully dependent on the Lord, dismissing reliance upon yourself, which is self-government, and emptying yourself of carnal ego, which ironically always exalts a person in God's eyes. Humility will always exalt you. See, humility shows that you can accept responsibility. Humility shows that you can accept if you do something wrong or you mess up, you take responsibility for it. You don't blame it on somebody else. You, 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 you're able to take the heat, as they say. See, the, the pit prepared Joseph for the palace, the character, as I said, that he needed. See, the character that he needed was found where? Humility is about bringing yourself low. He, the humility that he found was in the lowest place in Egypt, the pit. Don't disregard where God has you. See, another, another word for well, when we talked about wells this year, another word for well is pit. Don't disregard the pit. The, 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 you can even say it like this, there's power in transition. See, with promotion and power comes recognition. See, when you're recognized, Pharaoh recognized the gifts in, on Joseph's life. So what did he do? He gave him a new title, a new identity. See, Joseph, as I said, his name means he increases. But this was the name that Pharaoh gave Joseph. He changed his name to Zaphnath Paniah. Zaphnath Paniah. And this is what it means. It means the treasury of the glorious rest. But it also means this. There's different translations. The salvation of the world. The prince of the life of the world. The food of life. See, Joseph ascended out of a pit to save the world. He's a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Joseph's life was a type and shadow of Jesus coming out of the pit to be the savior of the world, of Egypt. See, it took 22 years for Joseph to understand that dream. And I believe it wasn't until his brothers were brought before him and they bowed down before him that it clicked and that he understood this is that. I believe that's when he had the revelation of what that dream actually meant. And the reason why he was able to receive his brothers was because he forgave them. Everybody say forgiveness. forgiveness. See, we can see that in the, in the names of Joseph's Sons. He had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. See, Manasseh's name means God has made me forget all of my hardship and my father's household. He forgave them. And Ephraim means God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. He was humbled. So the names of his children showed his character of who he was, where he was at. He was at peace 
with that. See, true power forgives. See, true power forgives. And when you can forgive, when you forgive others, and when he could forgive his brothers, he could, was able to provide a place of refuge for his family and for the future of Israel. See, true power shows love and compassion, but don't ever mistake love and compassion and meekness or submission for weakness. See, true power promotes humility, not pride. True power shows grace and mercy and is humble, and it also protects and provides and has shelter and growth. That's Jesus. See, that's Joseph. That's Jesus. That's the Savior of the world. That's what Joseph was given that new title, and that's exactly what he did. He, it says that he went out at 30 years old. It's from, at 17 years old, he was sold. At 30 years old, he was standing before Pharaoh and given a, given a new title. And then two years, I believe it was seven years, seven years passed after that, and then another two years before his brothers came. And why don't you stand with me? See, God has given us power through the Holy Spirit. And he's given us authority in his name. But the question is, what are we going to do with it? What do we do with the gifts? What do we do with the power? What do we do with the authority that he's given to us? Do we want to build our kingdom or do we want to build his kingdom? When he blesses us with wealth and, and he increases us in, in our job and in our business and promotes us, what, what are we doing with it? Who, who is it for? Yes, it's for us, but also because of what God has placed on our life. Why? Because he wants us to be able to build his kingdom. Amen? Amen. So question is, what are you going to do with it? You know, one of the other things that Roseanne was rambling about in her dissertation in the prophetic talking to Jesus was there's a huge army. There's a, she, everything she said, she repeated for five minutes roughly, like over, just constant. And she was talking about this humongous army, this, this army, the army's rising, the army's rising, the army's rising, the army's here. It's huge, it's powerful. See, that's what God, he's calling us up. He's calling us up. He's calling us up higher. He's calling us up higher. So the question is, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? I know what I want to do with it. So don't discount, dis, don't discount the provision that comes on your life. Don't discount the gifts that God has given you. Use them to glorify his kingdom. When, when the promotion and the opportunity comes, when God blesses you, step into it and know it's for him. Yeah? Yes. All right. So, Father, I thank you today that for the power, the provision, the increase that is coming to all of us, your church, your people, Lord, not only in the marketplace, but in the church, God. And I just pray blessing and I release it over them today, Lord. I ask that you would... Lord, pour out your favor, Lord, and I ask you, Lord, just as Joseph was highly favored to stand and do all the things that you called him to do, Lord, I pray favor and grace over your people to go and do everything that you called them to do, Lord, and to be ambassadors for you, Jesus, in this earth, and Lord, that you would promote them and you would provide for them along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you need prayer, we're here. If not, God bless you and have a wonderful holiday weekend.